Okay, here we go. Okay, so now I want to start looking at ways we can start reclassifying effective demand to include the impact of, of lending. And this is preliminary stuff that's uh, work we've done with Mathias Roselli, and we're still debating how to actually make the whole thing hold together. But I think the basic principle is a set of guidelines makes sense to say that if you look at the normal national accounting principles, you say that income is wages plus profits. Interest cancels out, but as you saw, even when you look at the, at the endogenous money, it's, it distributes income from one point to another. It doesn't create an additional income. So you can resolve all income to wages plus profits. And you can divide profits into distributed profits and retained earnings. There's my expression for income. Ah, pardon me. Uh, expenditure, we're well, living at asset markets and government and international, just looking at a, a single national economy and not taking into account asset markets or government as yet, though you can do it, is either consumption or investment goods are purchased. So that's your expenditure. And we know there's two sources of demand for consumer goods, workers and capitalists. So that's their demand by, by uh, workers, including change in debt. And that's demand by capitalists, including change in debt, knowing now that change in debt doesn't mean somebody's increase or somebody else's decrease. That's the essential part about endogenous money. But of course, that can be negative, in which case workers, inverted commas, save, and the same thing for capitalists. But the essential thing is that debt is added onto demand. It's not subtracted from somewhere else in the system. It's added onto the total for demand. And for investment, the same sort of story. You can invest out of retained earnings or new debt. And that's borrowing, which of course can also be negative. So when you compare the two equations, there's your consumption equation. And you expand what that actually is financed by. It's wages plus change in debt, profit plus change in debt, retained earnings plus change in debt. Rearrange them and subtract income and area cancellations so to change in that finances expenditure beyond income which is the point that Schumpeter made and Fisher made and Minsky made and so on so in the, for the non-bank financial sector with the, the strict way to define it expenditure is income plus change in debt and that is not uh, detracted for by out of, out of the banking sectors. Um, it, its debt doesn't mean it can spend less. Okay. If you get the overall accounting identity, but you don't, but, but you don't get, uh, you, you don't remove the importance of debt from the argument. Now it sounds like double counting to a lot of people. I've been through this at post Keynesians as well, because I think of the confusion of ex ante and ex post. And again, this is where Nick Rowe's argument, interpreting it from the point of view of an ex ante pr proposal which then is reconciled ex post, in terms of how you measure it, uh, again makes sense. And we always fall into ex post thinking, one of the little traps that economists do all the time, which is if you compare recorded income and recorded expenditure, then you'll find they're equal because the change in debt has financed somebody's income after the event. So one way to look at it is to imagine spending over a day. They've got 24 hours in the day. And let's say expenditure, income and expenditure are both running at a billion dollars per day at that rate, up to a point at which somebody takes out additional debt or additional debt is taken out, say $100 million. And once that money is borrowed and then spent, it becomes somebody's income and it continues circulating as income. So you then get this jump occurring at that point. Now looking at it in the ex ante, what that's income ex ante. That's the change in debt. And that's expenditure. But if you measure backwards, you're going to find recorded income at time D is going to be include the impact of the change in debt. And when you measure, what you're doing is looking at the area beneath the curves. If you start from D minus 3 and go out to D plus 3, your level of income over that six hour period and expenditure will be 262 million. Now, if you chose a previous six hour block, it would have been 250 million leaving out the impact of the change in debt. So the reason we're, I think, making the mistake of not seeing that happen is you can actually define income, the flow of income 
before the debt's taken out of being $1 billion a day and the flow of expenditure being the same, then at the point where it's taken out, the flow of income is still $1 billion, but the flow of expenditure is $1.1 billion, which is the income plus the change in debt. Okay? And then after that point occurs, the flow of expenditure, income and the flow of expenditure are both $1.1 billion a day. That's so that, that particular point at which the money comes in that I think is why we've missed this from an accounting point of view. Make sense? More work to be done to get, uh, to get deeply into it, but you saw the impact of me bringing in that change of debt in endogenous money. That's trying to put it in the same way. So I think the overall principle is that aggregate demand in an economy is income plus that change in debt, from an ex-ante point of view. And aggregate supply isn't just goods and services, it's also what's happening on the finance markets. And I call this net asset turnover because we don't buy and sell all assets at once. There's a price level for assets, a quantity of assets, and a fraction of them that turn over in an annual basis. And then you've got this argument that there's going to be a relationship between change in debt and the level of economic output, GDP, employment, and so on. And when you look at the rate of change, the acceleration of debt is going to be part of change in demand. And that's going to give you, amongst other things, a relationship between acceleration of debt and change in asset prices. The correlation will be between the acceleration of debt and the change in asset prices. And that's one reason why asset prices bubbles have to burst, because you can't have accelerating debt forever. Okay. Things, something, one thing, something can grow forever, but nothing can accelerate forever. Okay. So you look at the empirical data, as I've shown you in that early slides in the last lecture, but also looking here, I'm now looking at GDP and the change in debt. So the red line is GDP alone in America. And notice the crisis began before the recorded drop in nominal GDP. But it began when the rate of change of debt started to slow down. And if you add them together to get an implied effective demand level, pardon me, uh, then you get the turning point is almost precisely when the rate of growth of debt slowed down in the crisis. This, this is the effective or aggregate demand shock that neoclassicals admit happened but can't find out where it, where it happened. Yeah? Well, you said that uh, things cannot accelerate forever. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, uh, in the physical world, <laughs> uh, this happens and uh, this can lead to uh, some very stable uh, patterns where, for instance, uh, like when you have uh, a planet in orbit uh, around the uh, around, uh, sun, it's the planet is accelerating uh, forever. Then, the, nevertheless, nevertheless, you that, that's, that's you, you the with uh, another, another force that, uh, that uh, yeah. There's a there's a balance between those two forces. Okay, good point. That, that when you've got rotation, you have got acceleration. Good point. Yeah, yeah. but you don't have the planet getting faster. Yeah, if it did actually speed up as well as having like the technical acceleration from angular velocity, uh -huh. it was also if its speed was increasing, it would leave the, the solar system. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, but good good point. That's a, okay, some things can accelerate forever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now looking at acceleration of private debt in the crisis, this is looking at the acceleration of debt and the change in employment between 1980 and today. Now again, this, this should be a trivial correlation because the neoclassical theory allows for what they call the financial accelerator, which is a price effect, but nothing like a quantity effect like I've got here. I just I've turned it upside down so you can see the correlation, just how strong it is. And it's over, you know, 35 years worth of data, virtually. Looking also at mortgage debt. <coughs> so the fundamental cause of house price bubbles is accelerating debt. Yeah. In this case, you have a price in the first one, you have a real, real sector. Yeah, yeah. So meaning that credit can affect both values, and price oh, yeah. of an asset and also a real value. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm, what I'm, I'm looking at the employment, which is the volume thing for um, ag the, the impact on the real economy. But of course, pr asset prices are the most flexible thing. You, it's, it's harder to create new assets than it is to increase their prices. So most of the effect will go through prices, but it will also go through quantity. It can also go through the proportion that it turned over. In a, in a year. 
Now I'm wondering if you have to distribute, you know, the effect between these two variables, why the correlation is so high. Yeah. It's, uh, it's phenomenal, isn't it? And the thing of I mean, I, I sort of think, if, even if my logic is wrong, guys, is, you know, which, which is unlikely, the empirical correlations are stunning. And why on earth are we ignoring this stuff? You know, actually getting there and trying to understand it. Yeah. So that's the, uh, pardon me, I'm not feeling particularly um, good right now. Um, so, so that's the empirical. What I'm now trying to do is to enable us to model the world in that monetary way because clearly leaving it out of macro has been a major mistake. And in doing it, I've built one tentative model, which I know is not stock flow consistent now. I need to have a stock adjustment mechanism that I don't have in there at the moment. But when I simulate this particular model, you can see it's all double entry bookkeeping based here. <coughs> Pardon me. I was just pointing out all the, all the flows are double entry consistent, but I haven't got consistent profit and income distributions as yet. But when I simulate it, remember the last model I showed you had a, a volatility collapse. This one has a straight collapse. The further work to go, it's not, it's not a final model, it's not uh, completely correct, but it's leading in the right direction. What do you get by including the banking sector? You can cover deflation as well as a debt crisis. So it's not, it's not, the, um, it's not, not a fully correct model, but it's, it's showing the idea of where we could go uh, once we get the entire logic put together. So I'm working on that right now, trying to make it consistent by having a, a stock adjustment mechanism inside there and variable capacity utilisation, then, then it'll be analytically correct. At the moment it's not. So that's the model there. Um, and the long-term ambition is to go beyond just a single sector to do multi-sectoral dynamics. And I've already done that in Mathematica. So this is an output of a Mathematica model with four sectors and dynamic pricing etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and of course a single model describes a single economy once you've got a, a fully specified single economy then another structure identical structure with different parameter values and different reaction functions and so on describes another national economy and you can link them together with international financial and trade flows so the idea is to end up I hope and this is why I keep on using meteorology in my example to make it a basis that can go as far as Lorenz's model did in meteorology that it doesn't have to have any of the absurd assumptions that neoclassical theory requires to keep on going. And so fundamentally, because this is going to be my ending point, uh, what we're doing for some time is being modelling capitalism without banks debt and money is a bit like modelling birds without wings. And I'm sorry, we all know they've got them. And they sort of play some essential role. But thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry I'm so crook on the final day of the lecture. But, uh, any questions and so on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, without losing, uh, I mean, without losing the like uh, an, uh, proper understanding of what's doing your model. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a it's a concern that I I, I, I share with you know former co colleagues of mine in you know, meteorology. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think there is this tendency to towards uh, always complexify models. Yeah. To a point that. Uh, you know, you, you sort of uh, end up studying your, your own robot uh, instead of studying, studying the, the reality. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, to what point your, uh, the, even, even the simple uh, model you just present yeah. is uh, sort of hyperstatic in the, in the sense that you have like such a number of uh, uh, degrees of freedom that yeah. you, you, can, you can do whatever you want or you can, you can you can make, you can, uh, you can, it can lead to uh, to the trajectory you want, you want it to be, right? Um, I mean, I mean, changing the, the changing the numbers or the values of the parameters, maybe you can, you can make this model do what, whatever you want. Or like you Except that there are structural elements to so this. This is loanable funds, and no matter what I do with loanable funds, I can't change the amount of money. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about qualitative variation like that. But I think it's things at the same time, you've, you've, you have to have some concept of understanding where your dynamics comes from. But with a complex system, sometimes you can't understand 
you know, you say that's how it behaves. And um, if the system we're in is a complex system, then we have to model it with that correct paradigm rather than bring it down to an equilibrium one. So it's definitely a danger, definitely a, a worry, but I'd rather have that worry than be pretending it's an equilibrium. But I mean, like, uh, um, my, my question is, to what point is it is worth uh, complexifying more? Even because this is a this is this is a, a fairly complicated model. Even though you, you might you might say that it's, it's very simple. I would. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I mean, like to me, it's it's already like a, a, a kind of, of complex complex model. And and, uh, and if, uh, I mean, like, uh, it, it might be worth to stop at that point and understand very well what's going on with that one, instead yeah. of trying to complexify more and more and more. Yeah, I, I think part, part of what I've done this for is because I want to give something which we can give to policy makers and say, okay, you want to change this particular policy rule here, yeah. let's see what happens when you do it, okay. you know? yeah. and, um, and, and keep it at that level, and then you can come back and say, well, what's actually happened is a feedback effect you weren't thinking about <clears throat> that made this change, that meant that this didn't work at all like you thought it would, you know, okay. that sort of thing. So. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a that's an important ambition, but at the same time, it's also the temptation is always there to try to model the world. You know, mm -hmm. so you you have to keep both those make both those extremes possible yeah. in the one paradigm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the problem is uh, with, uh, like for instance, climate models. Yeah. In my in my opinion, it's just that they have, they have become a, just a mess. And, yeah. Um, and I mean, like uh, people are trying to connect uh, so many components, which. Uh, which uh, you know are full of non-linearities and chaotic behaviors that they're just uh, modeling uh, what whoever knows. But uh, in some at some point they just they've just built a Frankenstein, and uh, what's going out of it? I mean, I mean nobody can can know where it, it, uh, it actually comes from. Comes from, and, and, yeah. and I think it's it's dangerous. This this tendency. Yeah, are most of those models written in like straight in code and C plus plus and yeah, I mean, like, yeah. They don't actually, they have a visual interface like this, or actually... No, I mean, it, I, I haven't seen, I haven't seen a such graphical, uh, graphical application, but I mean, you, you can use MATLAB and, and, uh, and build a very simple, for instance, climate model. Yeah. Like, you know, like, uh, just, uh, you know, no, no moisture in the atmosphere and, and just, uh, and just uh, like, uh, a sea planet. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and, and like, a, a very small, small, or a lightly stratified atmosphere. But, uh, but I mean, like, once you enter in more complex complex models, then you got to yeah, you got to do programming. You all, you always you you will you will always uh, have something missing in in the in this kind of interface. Yeah. So I mean, you have you have to, to program it yourself. But I mean, like, I mean, that's my concern with yeah. this type of uh, Frankenstein we are building. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why yeah, I'm asking you this question. Yeah, that's a good point. It's a good point. I'm just uh, aware that uh, if, at the moment we're so far from Frankenstein what economics does that it's. I mean, we're we're in kindergarten rather than Frankenstein, you know. <laughs> sure, sure. And I want to take us at least as so we can complain about being Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it's very interesting, you know, by the way. I'm, I'm just. Uh, oh yeah, that's it. Uh, the good, the good. Part, but, I mean, it's, yeah. I, I think I think it's it's really uh, it's like uh, um, impressive the way you, you can. Try to to, uh, to understand a little the the nonlinearities which which uh, which is in, I mean, inside our the, the, the way uh, capitalist economy functions. So yeah. Yeah. Very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, regarding um, William uh, and worries on the degrees of freedom that we have in these models. Yeah. Certainly, we have degrees of freedom in the economics when we are modeling. But even in these models, we have some constraints. Uh, budget constraints, for instance, for any institutional agents are quite important in models in which, in which we have flow matrices and, and, and balance sheets. Yeah. So we need to respect uh, the budget constraints of e e any institutional agent. This is one thing that is important. Even in neoclassical models, in intertemporal dynamic models, you have this non policy uh, condition that is imposed on, on the model in order to respect some constraints. Okay, yeah. so 
uh, in terms of non-linearities, maybe we, we, we can do many things. Uh, but in terms of the accounting, uh, we need to respect some constraints. Yeah, I mean, like, for instance, in atmospheric science, you need the conservation of mass. It's, it's, it's a, you know, sort of a similar, uh, similar pattern. You right. like this type of constraint. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, uh, like, the parameters which enter in, in, the, in the equations which are, which are uh, because they are, they, are, they are parameters, you know? Yeah, yeah. You yeah. have uh, to, to choose the value of, so, um, so these parameters, if you change the value, it may be maybe to, to something, to, uh, to some behavior that are, that are completely different. And my concern is that if you build something very complica complicated, uh, at some point, if you have many parameters, by tuning the parameters, you can make your model follow whatever pattern that the economy has has uh, has followed uh, in the past, and you might you might uh, you know like that's what's happening with climate model, for instance. Yeah, you get like the evolution of the global temperature for the past uh, like, like decades, and uh, you know with a with a you know uh, complicated enough model with uh, uh, like many parameters, you can tune the parameters so that your your uh, your model is going to be able. I mean. Like, you have like a, a level of complexity, uh, which is which is enough, but you, you, you can make your model follow what you have observed. Yeah. So, I mean, because yeah, you, know, you can always tune it, <laughs> and uh, for whatever si for one situation in particular that is the reali realization of what have been the, the past climate, you can build a ad hoc model that is going to be able to reproduce what have what have been done. But I mean, it doesn't mean that you 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 have catch up. What is the internal dynamics and, and the, the, the logic which is, which is in it? So the, the, there is a rule, a simple rule that economies should follow, which is the following one. If a simple model can say the same thing than a complex one, then the best model is the simple one. And unfortunately, sometimes economies do not follow that rule. Mm -hmm. I think it's the main worry here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I, I think it's. I would love to have these problems in economics, <laughs> because what we've done is instead model the things that leave out incredibly important essential structural and dynamic elements of the system, and they, in fact, have got that that same house we talk about with complexity, like DSGE models, people, the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium oh, models, yeah. like the paper by Ireland, for example, explaining the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And the explanation was that uh, the model was hit by a shock just like the previous 1991, only it went on for longer and it was larger. So the explanation of the model was the size of the shocks that were then needed to fit, you know, make the model fit the data. And, you know, he didn't actually, he didn't specify what those shocks may have been to technology and preferences, which are the only shocks he could bring in. So that's the parameter fitting obsessions become part of DSGE modeling itself without it having any of the dynamics, without it having the structural um, realism the model like this imposes. So we, we have the disease without, with, without the, um, you know, the, the symptom without the disease, if you like. We, we just don't have the, um, uh, we don't have justifiable levels of complexity to get the results people are getting where they are doing that same sort of obsession with parameter fitting. Yeah. I mean, one, one, one interesting approach to deal with that is a stochastic approach. Like you know, perturbating uh, like the parameters and uh, just run many many types of simulation. Yeah. And, and you get an envelope. And at the end, well, I mean, like, of course, you you can you cannot uh, you cannot uh, sketch uh, an attractor where you have like uh, like more than four <laughs> four uh, four dimensions. Yeah. But um, but I mean, like stochastic uh, simulation, maybe it's, it's interesting too. Because you just uh, it just uh, draws you the, uh, the, the like uh, the possible the possible states of the economy mm. uh, within a certain range of the variation of, of the parameter you put in. Yeah, yeah, and again, the, the intention to get the capacity to do that as part of the development proposal for Minsky as well. It'll just take programming time to get there. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah, it's it's only scattered at the moment. That's all we've got the capacity for right now. Yeah. Can you Oh yeah, well you've got it. Well, we've, we've, yeah, what, what, what I've got at the moment is we've got firms borrowing debt. But if I come inside here and say, for example, if we have, uh, you imagine workers borrowing money, 
then you have to create another entry here which you might call like loans ah I must, yes thank you Russell <laughs> skip message oh dear I, I was going to type loans underscore and it, it reacted when I type loans inside there underscore yes good W okay so now I've got a new entry here which is loans to uh, to workers and if I then had um, you know whack an extra row here and say you had extra loan to the workers there and then you have this being over here then you've just expanded to include consumption loans okay. and oh imports and versus yeah again at the moment it's only modeling like a single national economy you could mock up a, a global economy by having like two banks one for a one economy one for the other and then have the transactions done that way. Our intention is to get to the stage where you can define an entire structure like this and call it an economy and then link that to another identically structured but differently defined entity and then you have imports and exports between them and financial flows etc etc. So yeah you could do it right now to be hard work. We intend making it something which is quite straightforward um, maybe in a year's time. Well, what you, I mean, I haven't tried it. <laughs> so, but what I would say is, if you had, if you had running a trade deficit, then you're borrowing money from the rest of the world to finance your deficit, and you're paying you to service that debt. So you then have a transfer of capital, effectively, out of your economy. And I, that, I, I want to capture that because I think there's a lot of uh, nonsense at both extremes in international trade theory both with the neoclassical vision, which is completely wrong, but some stuff I've seen in heterodox economics I don't like either. Like it ignores the whole capital account issue. Well, the idea oh, to be, with you design Minsky properly, you'd be showing the capital account impact implications of a trade deficit explicitly in the model. And therefore you'd have ca capital transfers going out of your economy and ownership of assets shifting. Uh, income distribution would no longer be the same as, like gross national, a uh, product would no longer be the same as gross national income, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Just about, in your opinion, uh, how dangerous is the financial fragility in a dollarized economy? Uh, well, I think the main danger in a dollarized economy is running a trade deficit, which you don't run at the moment. But, it's, uh, but I think it's still there because you still have the capacity to create money endogenously in an economy like this. Your banks are lending money, they're creating dollars by doing it. And from what I can see from the data, you do have a debt bubble going on here. Not in mortgages, but in personal loans and business loans. And there's been a, about a 50% increase in the, the, GDP, the debt to GDP ratio in Ecuador in the last 10 years. So that means you've actually expanded you know, a financial bubble in that sense, um, because your debt's growing that much faster than GDP. So I do think you do have an issue here. Even though you're a dollarized economy, your banks can still create money by lending. Yeah. In, um, maybe I misunderstood uh, some points of the course, <laughs> but um, how would you how would you integrate in the uh, in the model the um, all the speculative activities and uh, for instance the fact that uh, you know I think that uh, multiplication of derivatives. And yeah. To what extent is that already is already there with the with the this this, uh, this bank system, or, or would you have to, to add something else? You have to add an extra you know a set of columns to record money that goes to uh, financial asset markets rather than going to productive investment. So you add additional columns in there, then have the financial transfers. So people are borrowing money to speculate rather than borrowing money to construct, and then you have an asset market which would expand because of the extra money coming in and so on and so forth. So it certainly can be done. I've done, I've done a simple model of Ponzi finance in, Min in Minsky already, but not an elaborate one. So um, yeah, it's quite feasible to do that. Of course, it's essential too, given how much that's part of what modern capitalism is about. Well, I'm going to go back to my hotel room and die, I think, everybody. So <laughs> thanks for uh, being great students. Thank you.